Okay. Um, we have a fair amount of stuff that I'd like to cover. So we can take questions, but we kind of need to move it along as well. So don't be afraid to ask, but let's, let's try to. <laughs> <laughs> no questions, but questions. Um, what am I trying to do with this talk? The audience is people with prior reflex knowledge. If you don't have prior reflex knowledge, you might be able to keep up, keep up and learn things. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, you're not really the target. And the reason is because there's a few people who have been doing reflex for production real world apps. And the experiences that we've had have not gotten put out there publicly. And uh, this is a, a, a attempt at remedying that. So, um, and if you're interested in building these apps, then, then this talk is exactly for you. And hopefully uh, you can learn things. If you are a beginner and you don't understand, by all means, hit me up afterwards and we can go into more detail. So what is my experience? I've built two production reflex apps. Um, one was about 14,000 lines of code while I was at Seastone a few years ago. And now the app that we're working on attacks is about 21,000 lines of code at the moment. And um, so those are pretty substantial projects. We've learned a lot in the course of doing that. And this talk is a summary of that stuff. I also have a few small projects, hsnippet.com, which is the fastest way to start writing reflex code. You just go there and log in and start writing. Um, and a few other, few other miscellaneous libraries. So the goal of this talk is, um, yes, building, building UIs with reflex is fantastic. But there are some things that are not obvious about it. It's not a silver bullet. There are no silver bullets. <laughs> and, uh, and we're going to explore some of the less obvious things that might take a while to learn on your own through the School of Hard Knocks, like, uh, like I have done. And hopefully, you can have a faster uh, large app development experience. So got a few five main, main sections. I want to give a quick overview of the Reflex API. I want to talk about what I call existence and maybe. Some widget patterns that, are, that just come up a lot. Um, talk a little bit about FRP frames, which is about how Reflex uh, works under the hood. And there are some things that, that impacts with how you design your applications. And then causality loops and uh, how to debug them. You will forget this. I know you will forget this because I've given essentially this talk to several coworkers, and months later they come back and ask questions <laughs> that were answered in the talk. Come back to it. Don't feel bad. There's a lot of material here. It's difficult to absorb, and uh, I think that's just the normal the normal process. If you if you don't forget this, I would say you're the abnormal. <laughs> So a quick note on code examples. Um, the actual type signature in Reflex is this top one here. And it, there's always, or almost always, a monad widget TM constraint or some kind of a constraint like it. And then the dynamic T foo, event T unit. Um, the, the core types dynamic event and behavior have a T type parameter associated with them. I'm, in this presentation, I'm just going to leave those out for shortness so that I can fit things on the slides. But uh, the, that's the actual type signature, and um, this is the simplified version that I'm using in this talk. So the API. There are three core abstractions in Reflex, event, behavior, and dynamic. An event notifies you when something happens. Um, there's a classic paper, Push-Pull Functional Reactive Programming by Kyle Elliott, and the event is the push in that push-pull. A behavior has a value at every point in time. Very, very key thing here, and I didn't realize it at the beginning. And this is the pull. It, because it has a value at every point in time, you can ask it what its value is at any point in time, and it will tell you. That's the pull side. And something that I think is unique to Reflex is called dynamic. And dynamic gives you both of these two. Sometimes you have 
a value at all points in time, and you want to be notified when it changes. That's when you want to use a dynamic. I kind of answered it, but when I first started using Reflex, my biggest question was, which one do I use? I didn't have this solid intuition built in my head. And I kind of already answered the question, but it bears repeating. If you need to know only when something happens, then use an event, because that's what an event tells you. If you need to be able to retrieve the, the value at an arbitrary point in time, then use a behavior. And if you need both, then use a dynamic. That is exactly what the, the definition is. It just takes a while to sink in. Um, I definitely have to come back to this uh, multiple times. So, okay, that still doesn't help you answer the question. Well, the Dolly API is primarily push oriented. So if you think for a moment, how would you implement this dying text function where it give it a dynamic text and it puts it in the DOM and controls the updates so that whenever the dynamic changes, the DOM changes. How would you implement this in JavaScript at the lowest possible level? Well, you have to know when it changes. So you, you, need, you need events. And you also need to be able to query the value at arbitrary points in time, because maybe at the beginning when you draw it, uh, you just have to query it right then because it wasn't updated yet. Um, or sometimes maybe maybe the screen is resized or something, and so the value didn't change. But but for something for some reason something is triggering a redraw, and you have to get the value. So you need you need both of these um, behavior and event assets. And that is why Dynamic encapsulates both of them. In web programming, the general rule is that Dynamic is usually going to be what you want over behavior. Behaviors don't end up being used very often. It's almost always Dynamic. And, it's, and in my mind, the, the way I uh, explain it to myself is that you kind of just need to be able to redraw things at arbitrary times. So this is a little summary of, of some of the operations that we uh, have as primitives for event and behavior. Event has a never, which just never fires. It's like an empty list. Uh, hold takes an initial value and then an event that gives you updates to that value and returns a behavior that, that is a step function. That the initial value starts at the beginning at neg time negative infinity, and it's, and it's this until a new event fires, and now it changes to this, and then the event fires again, and it changes to something else. That's what a hold does. Tag takes a behavior and an event, and it samples the behavior at the time that event fires. So the behavior is the value A that we have at all points in time, and B happens at discrete points in time, and uh, tag just says, oh, I'll look up the value of the behavior A at the time that B fires. Attach is very similar, except it gives you back the tuple of the value of the behavior and the value of the event when that event fired. Attach with, very similar. It just takes a function that you're going to apply to you know, the tuple as you see in the, at, at the return value of attach. And uh, oh, it looks like it, it scrolled off my slide here. Attach with gives you back an event C, which is the result of applying this function A to B to C. And then switch is it, a little bit harder to, harder to wrap your mind around. You have a behavior which, what's a behavior? It has a value at any point in time. And uh, so that means at any value, at any point in time, you can grab some stream of events. And switch will just give you the stream of events that's currently, you know, quote unquote, active in the behavior, is the way I think about it. Dynamic. We have current and updated, which are basically the accessor functions. I said that dynamic is a combination of a behavior and an event. Current gets the behavior out, and updated gets the event out. 
Constantine allows you to specify a dynamic that is, has the same value for all of time. Fairly, fairly uh, straightforward primitive. Hold dine is analogous to the hold that you saw for behavior in the earlier slide. It takes an initial value and then an event that gives you the updates to this value. And then the dynamic that it gives you back is a step function, essentially, uh, that, that has this value all at all points in time. And then fold dine is another really important way of constructing dynamics. You have an initial value, you have an, an event, and then you want to fold and have a uh, new value, value is a function, function of, of the previous, previous value, value and the and new, new, uh, new event. A couple, couple more functions. functions. We have we similar have tag attach and attach with functions to what we just saw for behaviors. They exist for dynamics as well. Instances. This, this was, uh, has not always been the case. In the current version of Reflex released on Hackage, we do not have a monad instance for dynamic and, or, or an applicative instance. This is in the most recent uh, code on GitHub, but these are the instance you, in, instances you have. Behavior and dynamic have all functor applicative in monad. Event only gives you functor. And a really common pattern that you'll see is something like this. You're F mapping over events or behaviors or dynamics. And so we use this dollar sign angle bracket F map operator quite frequently in reflex. And then sometimes you'll have an event that you just don't care about the value, say a button click gives you an event unit and you might want to just assign it to something essentially or you know const f, f map const and so this is less than dollar sign operator i had i had seen it much less frequently before i started using reflex and now that i'm using reflex it's all over the place so it's really a convenient operator now existence and maybe if you look at these hold functions there's a they, 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 can, they require you to pass an A. What if you don't have an A? What do you pass in? Use the adjunction, as you're going to learn in Runar's talk, um, which is a maybe. And essentially, all you have to do is do a rote substitution of instead of A, I'm going to use maybe there. If you've done that because you needed to represent the lack of a value, then the question is how do you go the other way? Well, we have standard pure Haskell with, uh, ways of going the other way. We have the maybe function, the from maybe function that both require you to give a default value. That's, that's kind of unsatisfying sometimes. Reflex gives us one more tool. And it's this fmap maybe function. Fmap maybe takes a function from an A to a maybe B and an event of A and it gives you back an event B. So basically you had this maybe B and Fmap maybe just magically gets rid of it. How can that happen? Well, it can happen because you can just suppress the event firing. If you ever were going to fire an event with a value of nothing, just don't fire. So event has this concept of maybe-ness inherently wrapped up inside of it. A map also has this same property. If you have a map and it, and it has some values that are nothing, you can just drop them and leave them out of the map. And uh, it's, it's a really slick little pattern and it, it's very, very useful in Reflex. And it, it wasn't obvious to me at the beginning how to handle this situation. And so, and so very commonly, we just do fmap maybe ID and we give it a, an event of a maybe, and it gives us back the event without the maybe. Oh, th this should probably be a, an A instead of a B. So common widget patterns. How would you write this widget right here? 
you're passing in an either text text. And maybe, maybe the definition of this widget is going to be, if it's a left, we assume it's an error. So we want to uh, display it in red, you know, with a span style error or something like that, or class error. And if it's a right, we just want to dis display the text in black or whatever the default color is. How are you going to write this, this widget? Well, you're going to pattern match. Pretty, pretty uh, straightforward, not super complicated Haskell. If it's a left, we're going to use this L class function to, to use a span with a red text class, and we're going to display the error. And if it's a right, we just display the text. Pretty straightforward. But what if you want to write dying text error where the input argument is not an either text text, but it's a dynamic either text text. This type signature right here. Take a moment. <laughs> Think about that. The previous one you could write a by map. So here you f map by map blah blah, and then one compose that text. So. Um, if we, whoops, wrong way. This text error has an M unit inside of it. It's a monadic function, and the monad here is that monad widget that I mentioned at the beginning, which is the DOM sequencing monad. So if you F map that, that thing, then your M ends up inside the dynamic, and you didn't accomplish what you wanted to accomplish. You can't pattern match because it's inside the dynamic and, and we don't know how to pattern match on dynamics. Enter higher order FRP. <laughs> Reflex has two core higher order FRP functions. And, and at the bottom line, at the end of the day, they're really concerned with collapsing that M inside of a reflex value, where, where by reflex value I mean behavior of the dynamic. Moving the M from the inside the value to outside the value. That's, that's the, the crux of higher order FRP. And it comes up all the time, at least in my use of reflex. And, and as a result, I feel that higher order FRP is essential if you want to really uh, represent real world problems in a composable way using FRP. So reflex has two functions, widget hold and dine. Widget hold, you should recognize this pattern. It's the same pattern that we saw with hold and hold dine. You take an initial value, in this case it's an MA, and an event of that same type, an event MA, and it gives you back an M dynamic A. It is exactly the same pattern, except Instead of being A's, we're, we're working with MA's, and so we're holding a widget. And we get back this dynamic with the M moved out. Dyne is, uh, kind of goes in a different direction. You can, you can uh, visualize this widget hold as, like, if you give me a thing and an event, I'll give you back a dynamic. That's like, how do we construct a dynamic? Dynamic construction uses that pattern. Dyn is kind of going the other way. It says if you already have a dynamic, and if you, if you already have a dynamic, there's no uh, super good way of getting from that dynamic back out to the, the pair of A and event A. And that's not completely true. It is possible, but there are some downsides if you want to go that direction. And so, Dyn, Dyn is here to handle the situation where you already created your dynamic and it's a dynamic M thing and you need to pull the M out. Now, once we, once we start talking about these kinds of uh, patterns here, we're going to end up with nested reactive values because a lot of times widgets return events or behaviors, or dynamics. So, classic case in point, a button. What does it return? It returns you an M event unit. 
and the event unit fires whenever the button is clicked. If you, if you plug the button into widget hold, what do you get? You, you get returned an M dynamic event. And so now you have nested reflex values, nested dynamics, nested events. And now we need to think about how to collapse these things. So we have a chart. <laughs> and uh, filling out this chart, I think, is an important thing that hasn't really been done in the reflex materials out there right now. And I think it's a useful exercise to do. So I think we're doing pretty good on time. Anyone have a suggestion for how to collapse a dynamic of a dynamic? John. John. So we're going to have the same thing here for behavior, behavior. And um, I don't know. Anyone have a suggestion for the next one or an, another one of these that jumps out at you? For, for which one? The second one. Second one? Fmap dot hold. And I'll, I'll throw in like IV because hold requires an, an uh, initial value. Is this, is this clear to everyone? How does that work though? Because then you use the dynamic of event, right? Like, wait, that doesn't type check. Right. Is, is that what you were, no, you were thinking? Not pull. Oh, pull. Like, like get the value out of the behavior. Ah, pull is something that I didn't mention. So it's <laughs> off limits. <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, we could um, do this. We could do current, which will convert our dynamic into a behavior. And we can put join in front of that. This is this is kind of a puzzle, and it is it was not at all obvious to me when I first started Reflex how what these functions were. The primitives weren't there. Ultimately, I think it would be I think it's an interesting problem to explore how we can generalize these things. I, I don't know exactly what this generalization would look like, but you can can maybe start imagining something. Um, but this, this pattern of join is a really common thing. And we can always convert a dynamic into a behavior just by calling current. So here we can also call current. And that gives us a behavior of an event. And then we saw a function earlier switch that collapsed a behavior of an event into just an event. So switch.current will collapse a dynamic event. Down here at the behavior event, this is just switch. What about this one? Behavior of dynamic. Any, any, any guesses? Yeah. Join dot fmap current. We're f mapping the current function inside since since behavior has a functor instance, we can f map inside of it. And that converts the inside dynamic into a behavior. Now we just have behavior behavior, and we see the line right below it that we can collapse those by calling join. Um, I think I've, I've kind of emphasized the point here. I have a, another slide with all of them. Going. <laughs> there are a few notes here. So when you have an event on the outside, you need to hold in order to get a dynamic or a behavior that you can then work with whatever's on the inside and, and use like the, the essential primitive uh, collapsing operations are join and switch, if that was not clear. Um, so you can, you can combine join and a, and a hold or switch and a hold to collapse these 
these situations when you have an event on the outside. There's also some functions switch promptly and switch prompt only. I would probably recommend that you shy away from these. We're gonna, the, the word prompt is gonna be mentioned a little bit later. Are they equivalent? No, they're not name equivalent. Um, and, and the word prompt is used in reflex to denote a certain type of thing. Um, the essential idea here is you can, you, your outer one and your inner one might fire at the same time. And then it's kind of what do you do when, the, when the, those two things fire at the same time? Now, I've, I've showed some collapsing functions. However, I need to give a caveat. When I started programming reflex, I couldn't stand having nested re reflex values. It just, uh, I always wanted to collapse them as soon as I got them. That's usually okay, but occasionally you'll encounter situations where you need to have, like these are, these are nested because they have a meaning. There's a semantic reason for them to be nested. It's, it's because you're switching between like say a different, different actual widget and that widget is the thing that gives you a stream of events. And sometimes you might want to have all of that information preserved until some later point where you use it in one case and you want to use it in this way and you use it in a different case and you want to use it in a different way. In those situations, you should not collapse them immediately. You should keep the nested version around until the point that you need to collapse them. This is pretty rare occasion. I can only require or recall one time in all of the reflex work I've done when that was something that I needed to do. But it's worth keeping in mind because it took me a while to, I, I'm banging my head, why isn't this value firing the way I want it to fire? Well, because I already collapsed it and I collapsed it in the wrong way. Another really common pattern here is, um, it is something that we see when we're needing to create widgets that get input. Uh, the, the really common pattern is what I, what I call, and, and I think um, some of the other reflex people, Ryan Trinkle, the author, also calls uh, a definitive widget or a widget that gives you back a definitive value. Dynamic. In general, you, you should think of it as being the definitive value for this thing. And if you get into a situation where you have a dynamic and you have another dynamic coming from somewhere else and they're both representing the same thing, then you get kind of get this, this dilemma of what's the definitive value of this thing. And this is where you can encounter problems when you, when you, you don't have a straight uh, picture of what's definitive or not. And so, if you see a widget that has this pattern where it, it takes an initial value, it takes an event of updates to that value and it returns you back a dynamic. This is a widget that kind of owns the thing as opposed to just being a view of a thing that someone else owns. And a view widget is a widget that takes in a dynamic, which the dynamic was created somewhere else by, by something else that quote unquote owns it. And the view widget just gives you the view of it, puts it into the DOM or wherever, wherever it is being used. And maybe the view widget will give you back an event of updates because maybe, maybe that widget had a control that allows the user to update the viewed thing. Uh, these are two patterns. It's, it's kind of uh, just been oral, oral pass, passed on between different people, uh, the, the, the categorization of these two patterns. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning and making a little bit more explicit. If you look at reflex DOM, all of the input widgets that they have are of the definitive form or almost all of them. I think there's a checkbox one that is checkbox view where they also supply a view widget, but most of them are definitive. And if, and, and I think the reason we don't have a full a component of view widgets because they're a little bit trickier to write and, uh, and write in a general way. Another way to think about the definitive widget is if you're trying to make a form, like a generic form element, say you have a data type, a person, and you're creating a widget that is the form for a person. 
And if you think about all the ways you might want to use this form, well, you're probably going to have CRUD, right? You're going to use the, this form to create a person, so have the user input a person, and okay, that's fine. In, in that case, you can just have a, a widget that doesn't take anything and returns a dynamic. But if you're, if you're using this widget, you're probably going to want to have an edit widget, which means you want to be able to supply an initial value. And that's why the A is here, to allow you to supply that initial value. If you didn't write it with the A up front, you're going to have to go in and refactor it and include the A so that people can supply an initial value. And then another situation is, okay, so we've got an initial value, great. And this is kind of the definitive widget for this thing. But sometimes other parts of the UI need to modify what is shown here. In, in the code, you'll see it called like a set value event. And that's what this event parameter is. It's an event that allows external parts of the UI to set what's in there on whatever, whatever they, it's, it's necessary. And then it returns back a dynamic. In, I, I should probably put a slide in for this, but in a lot of the, the reflex DOM input widgets, they don't return a dynamic, they return a data structure. And the data structure contains a dynamic. And then it also contains what I've come to call a change event. And the change event is, is really important in some cases because the change event only fires when the, the user modifies that control. The dynamic fires when the user modifies the control and when this set value event fires because the set value event is contributing to this quote unquote definitive value. But sometimes you also need to know when was only this control changed without changes that came in from the outside world. And uh, that's the purpose of the set value event in some of the reflex double models. Frames, FRP frames. They're, they're the, the low level of how, how this stuff actually works. A frame is an atomic time unit. And it begins with some kind of event, typically. Uh, say a mouse click. You click your mouse, something in the browser happens, and it gets to reflex, and it turns into an event fire. Then, in your reflex code, you've taken that event somewhere and you're using it elsewhere. And the way that you typically use an event is you fmap it, or you call tag or switch or one of these other functions that, uh, that have that event. And so then what happens? Reflex has to say, okay, well, here's all the things that are listening to the, this event. And we have this fmap here where we're adding one to the value, another fmap here where we're just discarding the value and taking unit and we're only interested when it fires. And we have to update all of these things. And we have to trigger those events to fire. And then we have to trigger anything that depends on them. It's a, it's a big signal graph. And reflex goes through and, and handles all the firings. And you just continue this process until there are no more firings. That's the end of a frame. It's like an atomic unit of time. It doesn't take zero clock time because it takes us time to calculate all of this stuff. But uh, conceptually speaking, it's, it's pretty much zero time. And uh, you want this to be atomic. And you want to not be able to distinguish between what happened when in, inside of a frame. The really key realization here is, and, and this is, in my opinion, the genius of dynamic as, as a construct, as an abstraction. Current gives you the behavior, updated gives you the events. Updated gets the new value from whatever, event, whatever thing is firing at now in the current frame. And current holds the value from the previous frame. So if you take these two things as a whole and you just think about what's the what's the current value now, then it is, it, it, if the event is firing right now in this frame, then the current value is updated because this is the new value that just came in. 
but it's really useful to have the behavior hanging around so that you can compare it with the old value. There are, there are plenty of situations where maybe you have a data structure, a dynamic person, and then the age of that person was changed, but the first name was not. And the fmap first name over this dynamic, now you have a dynamic text, which is just the first name of this person, but that dynamic fires because the parent structure changed. Nothing in this dynamic changed, but we have, we have the current, we have the old values, so we can compare them. And there's a function unique dyne, which compares them. And if the unique dyne imposes an EQ constraint, we didn't, you, know, you don't want to have that on dynamic, because then you can't have dynamics on functions and, and things that uh, can't be compared for equality. But unique dyne compares them, and if they didn't change, suppresses the firing. And that's a very important performance optimization technique. You, you can have a, 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 a dynamic firing, and then a whole bunch of widget and DOM drawing stuff are dependent on this firing. And if it's firing too much, and if it actually wasn't changed, then all these things are still going to be firing and redrawing the same value. That's a waste. You should just not fire. And that's what unique dyne does. And this is what I think is, is the, the true genius of dynamic. Causality loops. Let's see how long we have time. We're doing pretty well. So, in Reflex, the NPC people kind of uh, aren't used to it because it's combining the view with with the controller and a lot of the behaviors that are going on. So, imagine we have this tweet widget, and we have a button that says send tweet, and then we have a text area where they can type in the tweet. Great. That works. Everything's fine. Um, you know, whenever whenever this button is clicked, we uh, you know uh, we're, we're taking in the click. We're f mapping it const with empty string so that when you click the button, the the text area becomes empty again. What if you want them to be displayed on the screen in a different order? The monad that we are in here is the DOM sequencing on it. So when one thing comes before another thing, that means that the HTML for that thing is gonna come before the HTML for the next thing. That's what the monad is about. But we might wanna have the send tweet button be after the text area. That's a totally plausible thing to, to want. And if that's the case, we have to use recursive do. Recursive do is, is essential to reflex applications, and this is exactly why. Depends on the order that you want to display things in, because the ordering is DOM ordering, you, you know, you sometimes have, have data flow dependencies that are different from the DOM flow ordering. But we can get loops. <laughs> We can, here we have the click button, and then we have a form widget that takes an A, and then that A is being defined as the leftmost of some, some derivative of the click, and then the updated event from this form widget. We have to have this in a rec, and there's a loop going on here where if you click, it'll, it'll make A change. And then if A changes, it goes into form widgets. And then depending on the, the implementation of form widget, maybe that will cause val to change. And then val will cause A to change. And then A will cause val to change. And you just get a loop. These don't come up super often. But when they come up, they're a huge pain. <laughs> Your program just crashes, or there's, there's several different manifestations of an event loop. Um, and you're just like, 
my program crashed, or and then there's a few different messages that might be displayed, or maybe it's just consuming 100% CPU because work is being done in there. And you know nothing. <laughs> and you're just like, oh no, where do I start trying to figure out the problem here? Oops, what did I just do? <laughs> wow. Did you say runaway recursion? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, uh, oops. There we go. We're back? Okay, good. So, what are the symptoms of a loop? Sometimes your app just hangs, sometimes it hangs and it consumes 100% CPU. And then there are some bizarre error messages and they're not always predictable. One of the error messages is this height bag remove. Height 20 not present in bag height bag. <laughs> and you're just like, what in the world is happening to my app? Um, in some other cases, Reflex is maybe a little bit smarter and it just tells you causality loop found. And you're like, thanks. <laughs> can you can you give me some more help here? And there may even be other symptoms that I have not gotten, um, but I, I know that these two uh, I've seen and uh, recorded them. So what happens when you get a loop? There's a really key key realization here, which is that loops can only happen in recursive structures. Now, that doesn't mean that they can only happen in a rec or an mdo. Mdo is synonym for rec, essentially. They can happen just inside of a let clause, right? You can say, let A equals some function of B, let B equals some function of A. Pascal inherently has recursion powers inside of lets. That's never happened to me because you just tend to not need those things, or if you do need them, you know when you wrote them. You know how many times have you created mutually recursive functions? Not very often, and when you did, you knew what was going on. So that's not the typical failure mode. It's typically a wreck. I, I think, actually, I've never had a single time when I got an event loop that was in, in a let, a standalone let that did not also involve some kind of a wreck. Because typically, they're going into a widget, the widget has to be mon monadic, so it's not only the let recursion that is getting you into this trouble. It's, it's a rec, the, the do rec or an undo recursion. That's a really big clue. You can only have these event loops in rec blocks or undos. So, keep your recs as small as possible. How can we do that? If we look at this example, that was the one we just saw, the rec actually has nothing to do with this button add part. It's only the last two lines. So you should not write this first, this first version of the function. You should write the second one because that keeps the rec to the smallest possible part of your code. And then once you, once you have it at this size, you can pretty easily say or see here that oh the a the a is uh, going into form widget the form widget is giving me a val and the val is going into a and somehow this is an event loop. Now the, the key thing is an event loop is some is a loop that happens in the same frame. It's totally possible to have exempt and we have it all the time actually event loops structurally. But because they don't happen in the same frame, they're fine. It's, it's only when it's happening in one frame that our program dies. So keep your, keep your rec blocks as small as possible. And then a second strategy is just, just disable whole blocks of code. How do you do that? Well, you just replace 
um, and uh, some kind of an M units with just return units. And then whatever it was doing inside it, it there was, you probably had to pass in some events or whatever. Now you don't have to pass in anything. It just does nothing. It, whatever it was putting into the DOM it ends up blank. And uh, this is a great way to disable things. Another way is if you have an M that returns an event, just say return never. Can't possibly have an event loop in, with an event that never fires. Or if you have a dynamic, return const dying nothing. If it's a dynamic of a maybe. Or if it's a dynamic of, of, a, of a foo, then throw in some default value for the foo if, if that's constructible. These are all really useful strategies. Third strategy, binary search. Super powerful. What if you have a widget like this? You have, uh, say you're doing some kind of a little language or you've got a few different data types and you need an input field for, for all of them. And if it's, a, if it's a car, then you have a car widget. If it's a string, string widget. Daytime, daytime widget. I actually had a situation where there was an event loop somewhere in here. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> But it actually ends up, ends up not being too bad. Whoops. Because you can do this. If, if uh, it's any of those first four, now the, the markup just isn't there anymore. And if it's the last four, then it's still there. If, you, if your event loop still happens when you comment these lines out, you know the problem is within the second half. So then comment out the second half and see if there's a problem with the first half. And if, if the event loop still fires here, then it's in the first half. And if it still fires in both, then you've got an event loop in both places. Okay, so now we've narrowed it down. There's no event loop in the first four. Now comment out the next half. This is, this is a, it, it seems horrible. It's really effective. This is log, log reduction. <laughs> And it doesn't take very long to find the culprit. And I literally have gone through this exact process, and it makes finding event loops pretty tolerable, actually. This, is, this gets to the whole, what's the, the debate between IDEs and stepping through your code and, and you know, Haskell and just equationally reasoning about your code. This is a, this is a really effective strategy. So we figured out that our event loop is on this input or the enum widget thing is somehow the culprit. There's, a, there's definitely going to be something passed into enum widget, um, and it's going to be returning something, and that's almost definitely going to be a part here because there's no rec in this code. So this code is inside some other rec that is that is causing um, the loop. So how do you fix them? Use current. If you don't use currents, then you're using something based on the, the current, the most recent firing of the event. And if you just use currents on a dynamic, now you're last frame. And if that was a part of your event loop, your event loop is gone, which is really, really slick. And avoid using promptly functions because promptly is the word that the reflex API uses to mean we, we want to, if there's a change that happens in this frame, roughly speaking, we want to react to that. We don't want to react to the, the previous value that we had. So as a general rule, I would just say always avoid the promptly functions if possible. And then if you have, if you run into some kind of behavior and it's just not updating fast enough, then you can go back and you can say, okay, maybe I can use a promptly function here and it'll update when I need it. And odds are you won't have an event loop there and then it's fine. And if you do have an event loop and you thought you needed it, then you need to re-examine your, your assumptions. So here are two examples that I have actually encountered. I literally have commit log Fix the event loop, and the, and the div was exactly this. 
we, we had been using attach promptly dying with, and we changed it to use attach with and current. And then in a separate situation, we were using tag promptly dying, and we changed that to tag and current. Poof, event loop gone. Super, super powerful. This doesn't always fix the problem, but it, it fixes a significant percentage of them. Another strategy is you can use the widgets change event instead of the value. Because think about that structure of that uh, definitive widget that I showed earlier. It takes an A and an event A, which allows external things to update the value. And then it has usually an input element that also allows the user to update the value. And then it returns you back some, uh, a data structure with a dynamic and this, this uh, change event. And if you are using the dynamic and, you're, and it is going in and contributing to something that is getting passed in as the set value events, you have an event loop there. And so instead of using the dynamic, just use the change. And the change is coming from the DOM updates, not from the set value. And that can break the loops as well. And the third thing is that you have to have things that are sufficiently lazy. A lot of reflex, I, I, I attempted to say reflex would be impossible without laziness in Haskell. Or, uh, okay, in certain languages you can, you can implement laziness by using the function of, of something. Um, okay, yeah, I'm not saying that it can't be done in a non-lazy language, but you'd have to do, it, it uses laziness all over the place, and so you'd have to use these, these non-default non constructs everywhere if your language was not a lazy language. And Ryan Trinkle has gone to great pains to make sure that the, the values, dynamic event and behavior are sufficiently lazy to work in pretty much all the cases that you expect them to work. So if you have to pass things up a rack, only pass event behavior and dynamic. Do not pass tuple of dynamic and dynamic because the tuple is probably not lazy enough. I actually had a, a situation where I added a, what is it, the tilde for Haskell's laziness annotation, and that solved my event loop. And you just don't have to worry about that at all if you only pass dynamics, events, and behaviors, because Ryan has gone to great, great lengths to make sure that those are lazy enough. Here we go, don't pass tuple of event and events. Recap, we finished in time. For me, Reflex is the most enjoyable UI development experience I've had. It's, it's really nice. Again, it's not a silver bullet. There, there are mind-bending concepts going on here. It, there, there's some pretty significant learning curves, but it's, it's fun, it's stimulating, it's, it's a challenge, and I really enjoy it. And hopefully, these tips will help you get up and running with large-scale apps more quickly. Any questions? <laughs> my slide link is here. My email is here. I work at TACT. We are hiring. If you're interested, talk to me. We are especially looking for data people, data scientists, data engineers. So if you're a data person, definitely talk to us. Any questions? questions? So how is he able to make, or he was able to make um, event and monad without having any problems? Event is not a monad. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, dynamic. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't for a long time, and, and it's still not in Hacking yet. Um, and for, for all that time, he, he, had, he had a map dying function that was monadic. <laughs> That was basically fmap, except it wasn't fmap because it wasn't pure. It was monad. It could only be run inside the, the monad widget, and that just made things really, really much more painful to syntactically. 
They could all still be done, but it was syntactically ugly, and I don't know what magic went on under the hood to make that change. Other questions? So the question is, what is the advantage and disadvantage to the reflex model versus the Helm model, uh, roughly speaking? So I, I haven't worked with Helm. I can't speak from experience there. For me, the big advantage to the reflex model is composability. When you have a model separated out from a view, it's just not as composable. Um, here, it's just a widget, and, and the widget are, is a pure function. Yes, it's in the monad widget monad, but that's, that's kind of a, a, an orthogonal concept. It's, it's really a pure function of dynamics and events and behaviors that you pass in, and it only, the only things that it gives you back are dynamics and events and behaviors that it returns. And so, how do we compose these things? Same way we compose all of the pure functions. And, and that gives us boatloads of, of abstractions that we've built up in Haskell over decades now to, to work with composing these things. Whereas with a, um, an MVC model, it's a lot more complicated than that. If you wanna, if you wanna add something to uh, your, your view, but if that view, or if that thing that you want to add requires something to be stored, then you have to go and add something to your model. And, and to me, that's immediately not composable. I suppose you could come up with a method to like consolidate the model things and the view things, but then you're kind of uh, doing what we're doing here already. Uh, also, you can, you can use an Elm style in Reflex if you want. You can create a data structure that has actions and you know, pass around events and dynamics of this data structure and use them to impact things and, and structure your app that way. And the, the thing that I think is great about Reflex is that it's left up to you. Maybe you could argue that paradox of choice, you don't know oh, what's the right pattern here. The L, the L model very much takes away that choice and here is the way to do things. But, uh, and so maybe we're struggling with that right now in the reflex world because reflex is fairly new and, and we haven't built very many large apps yet and we're exploring this, this space of uh, abstractions. But I, I think it's fundamentally a, a more powerful system that I think will give us a, a better ability to solve problems and create, create self-contained abstractions. The, the, the one that I really like to, to uh, point out is an edit in place with it. It's not very complicated. There's maybe 200 lines of code or a little bit less. Has to keep track of some states of whether the widget is, is in edit mode or view mode. But it's a single function in Reflex. Edit in place, you pass in a few things and it gives you back uh, the event or dynamic. And uh, that's just great. I can drop it in anywhere. And, and so I, I think you could, you could say that the, the core here is that reflex widgets can allocate. And that's what, that's what that internal hidden state is. And then it's up to you to determine how to intelligently use the combination of internal state and state that's passed in and returned to create a, an application that works well and, and gives you the properties you're looking for. Any other questions? Thank you very much.